Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Kyle Rhodes. I'm the Dean of UTS Business School. I would just like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting today here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, and we pay respects to their ancestors and elders, also acknowledging these as the first peoples of this land. And of course, the acknowledgement takes on a, a special meaning this year, the year of the voice referendum. Um, I don't know if you're aware that uh, next week on the 4th of August, it will be National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children's Day, um, uh, a commemoration that began as a protest in 1988, the, the year of the bicentenary of uh, white Australia. Um, uh, now, uh, during the time of the stolen generation, um, indigenous children whose birthdays were undocumented and unknown um, were given the 4th of August as a national birthday for, for all of these children, and this is why this day was there. Other things that have happened around this time in history, a couple of weeks later, on the 17th of August of 2007, is the anniversary of the legislation that allowed the Northern, Northern Territory interven intervention under John Howard's rule um, at suspending the UN Racial Discrimination Act in, in, taking that, in, in taking that move. I think it's fairly clear from just two examples of history around this time that, that, that false white heroics have failed Indigenous Australia and, and time now, I think, at a very minimum for a voice to prevent such atrocities from happening again. Vote wisely, Australia. Um, I would also like to welcome you here to UTS, and specifically to UTS Business School. This is the building we're in now, the, where, where we work. We're very proud to, to be hosting this event. Um, uh, you know, specifically looking at the activism and advocacy that led to the change in the welfare payments to single mothers um, earlier this year. Effectively, uh, effectively uh, a series of actions that improved, uh, materially improved the lives of women and children around the country. Um, but also, I think today you'll be having, enjoying a discussion generally about how researchers, activists, policymakers, and the community can work together to achieve, achieve meaningful reform. This is democracy in action. Now, some of you who haven't been here before might be wondering, why on earth are we having this event in a business school? Um, why would a business school be interested in such things? We have a pretty bad rep in business schools. We've, we've earned it, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's well deserved. But here at UTS Business School, you know, as a group of scholars and teachers in business and economics, nothing could be more important to us than how business activity, economic policy, and economic management can and should support justice and progress. We aspire to be a different type of business school. We aspire to be a socially committed business school focused on developing and sharing knowledge for an innovative, sustainable, and prosperous economy in a fairer world. Now, when Anne Summers Anne joined the school last year as professor of domestic and family violence, it was a big step for us in helping, helping become that very business school who we aspire to be. And the, you know, the value and impact of Anne's research is, is second to none, quite amazing really, and serves as an exemplar and role model for what research can and should do in improving the lives of real people. It also serves as a role model for the fundamentally democratic role that universities have in contributing to social and economic justice and progress. You know, in an era where so many people think of universities as corporations and think of the higher education sector as an export industry, Anne reminds us that, that we are and can be so much more than that. So I would like to introduce you to your host and MC for this evening, the Honorable Verity First. Um, uh, Thank you. <laughs> I guess you know Verity. <laughs> uh, but, for the few of you who may not, uh, Verity is the Pro Vice Chancellor of Social Justice and Inclusion at UTS, um, and she leads the university's commitment to social justice and inclusion. Um, and that commitment ensures that, uh, sorry, that ensures that that commitment is embedded across all of the university's initiatives and activities. 
Verity, of course, has had a long career working at the highest levels of government, including being Minister for Education and Training in New South Wales, as well as New South Wales Minister for Women. Enough from me. Verity, over to you. Thank you. Oh, it's nice and loud. Thank you very much, Carl, and thank you for all of you for being here tonight. Uh, this evening's discussion, I also want to acknowledge, of course, that we're on the land of the Gadigal people and pay respect to Elders past and present. This evening tonight, we really are here to celebrate. We're here to celebrate a really big victory for women who have been campaigning close to decades for more economic justice in this country, particularly single parent women. Um, but we also wanted to do it as a bit of an anatomy of a campaign because there's something really interesting about how this change was achieved in the budget this year. And there was a whole lot of serendipitous moments and almost organic, you know, actors that emerged in the process. And we wanted to dig deep into that as well and hopefully learn a bit from what we think is a pretty interesting case study of social change. But I do have, before we launch in on that, and I can introduce my very illustrious panel, we're very excited to have them here tonight, I do have a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Firstly, we're live captioning the talk, so you can have a look on the screen over there. We're recording this session, and we will share the recording with you next week, so please feel free to share it um, widely. We had many, many people register for this event so that they could receive the recording. ABC Radio National are also interested in broadcasting this event. So when there is a Q&A session later, be aware you are being recorded and potentially being played to a national audience, so perhaps keep that in mind as you ask your questions. There will be um, a time for questions, so start thinking about what you want to ask, but keep your questions to the point <laughs> um, and hopefully with a question mark at the end. Um, a little... Over three months ago, Treasurer Jim Chalmers delivered the budget and announced an important change to the welfare payment for single parents. The government, the government announced that recipients of the parenting payment single would be eligible to continue to receive it until their youngest child turns 14, which was up from eight. The campaign to change that policy was driven by tireless advocacy over many, many years, particularly by some of the people on this panel, um, alongside many, many others from grassroots organisations through to philanthropic bodies through to parliamentarians. At the heart of the reform was the desire to prevent thousands of single mothers and their children from falling into poverty. The result, as I said before, is a great case study of effective advocacy and an organic alliance that emerged, including people with lived experience of single parenthood, activist and advocacy groups, academic researchers, philanthropic organisations, a government-backed task force that was set up explicitly to address women's economic participation, and of course a media who was prepared to tell the stories. So tonight, that's what we're going to be looking at. We'll be talking to some of the key participants um, and seeing what can be learnt from the success of this campaign. So I'm now going to tell you who we've got here with us tonight. First is Therese Edwards. Therese is the CEO of, Na of the National Council of Single Mothers and Their Children. She focuses on changing the dialogue on single mothers and making sure women's strengths, voices and respect are central to policy decisions. She assists women in navigating complex systems to gain the information that best supports and protects their families. Welcome, Therese. Anne Summers is a journalist, commentator and best-selling author. She is currently a Professor of Domestic and Family Violence here at UTS Business School, where she conducts innovative data-based research into domestic violence in Australia. Her 2022 report, The Choice, Violence or Poverty, influenced the federal government to make changes to the payment system for single mothers. Welcome, Anne. Sam Moston is the chair of the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, an independent group of eminent women established to provide advice to the Australian government to support the advancement of women's economic equality and achieve gender equality. 
Sam has extensive experience in governance roles across business, sport, the arts, policy, diversity, Indigenous and women's affairs, and the not-for-profit sectors. Welcome, Sam. <laughs> and last but not least, Laura Tingle. Laura Tingle has reported on Australian politics for more than 40 years. She has worked for the ABC since 2018 and previously held senior positions in print media, including more than a decade as political editor of the Australian Financial Review. She is the chief political correspondent for the 7.30 report and has written four quarterly essays, won two Walkley Awards and is president of the National Press Club of Australia. Welcome, Laura. So my first question is around the question of the, the, the false focus of the event, really. How do we change po bad policies and laws? So what I thought I might do is ask each of you to give me a bit of information on your background and what drove your involvement in the campaign to change the single parent payment. For Laura, I thought it would be interesting to see why you were so keen to report on the issue. But we might start f with you, Therese. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what drove your desire to work on this campaign. Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I flew in this morning from the Ghana lands and I do tread carefully and with respect because I know it's not my lands. It was always, it's never been ceded. So um, I, you will see me without papers because my story fits within my heart and my soul. So, um, I think what has driven me the most is I am the person who answers the phone, who responds to the emails, and mostly in cool 2023, it's private messages over the Facebook page. So there was, there was the... People will intuitively understand the financial ramifications of what that meant. And for a long time, we've spoken in the, in the framework of dollars and cents. What is less probably known is the respect, the way women see themselves and the way that they want to be seen. So most commonly, I would get a phone call from a woman who would say, I'm not like another single mum. And when we work, work that through, what she was trying to say in a way that was buying into that really brutal neoliberal framework is that I am amazing. I have stepped away from a really difficult situation and I've done that with absolute limited resources and I'm determined and fearless to carve out a life and to not let this be a mark on myself or my intergenerational um, role that I have as an absolute patriarch, uh, mm -hmm. matriarch. So that is what has driven me. What has really, really bugged me and has been equally burning is the... Um, I think most of us in this room, and I'd like to actually see that there's many hands on that that banner, that one that worked towards success. And it's a really important question because if you understand the history, you will then understand how important people have been in in coming along and and sharing that that load, that that load sometimes that felt a bit overwhelming. So um, what also kept me going was a belief, this burning belief that at one point in time we are going to have a moment and it's going to rain down with hope <laughs> and with justice and we're going to just wash out the, the shittiness that has been part of the <laughs> last two decades. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so if I can quickly just say that we've got people in the room who have been part of a bus that went from Sydney <laughs> to Parliament House full of single mums, um, that we had a, a I co-produced um, a documentary in 2014 um, that we, I actually thought in all fairness, mm. 
30 that we'd stopped the crap before it even happened. Mm. We'd done enough. Um, we, I wrote, I was the author of the um, first report that the United Nations had investigated um, on the treatment of, of women in this, in this country. So they were the things that sort of kept me going. But also, I think deeply and personally, I wanted to square up the ledger. And I was really spurred on between never, never dropping the ball, always wanting to, to fix that. And there was such an opportunity um, when I got announced onto the Women's Economic Equality mm. Task Force. My hand had been shown. <laughs> <laughs> we knew what, what I was going to try and do. Um, but I, I do want to share one particular moment. It was a very recent moment and it, it stays with me a lot. So on the 23rd of March, we because uh, we have no money, <laughs> so I have to work really hard and sometimes I don't get to events because I can't afford the, the flight. So we, we're not a well healed organisation by any stretch of the imagination and it's a whole lot of smoke and mirrors going on. But on the 23rd of, um, of March, through because of some philanthropic support that we got, I actually got to fly in uh, five women who live in poverty um, to be in the halls of parliament where they always should be. They always should be. But we were doing an early morning event and the night before we went out for dinner and it was just, you know, one of those loosely quick arranged mm. events and there's some other people that were in the room that were part of it but there was also Anne and Sam and there was some great folk from Swinburne and, and Tony Wren was there and there was just this moment where I, I actually got up and left and I sat back and I thought no one in this restaurant would be able to pick out who was in poverty and who wasn't. Mm. And if I can ever talk about what makes a successful campaign is that spirit of equity. Mm. So that was at the heart of, of that. Mm. And, um, and for reasons that I don't know why, <laughs> I was the driver of the car. So <laughs> I just... And I, I look, I got lost coming here. <laughs> so we had lots of time chatting. Um, but, but we got back and the, the, um, the women who were part of the event, they were so ready to go the next day. They were so ready. They were up and ready to speak mm. their truth because they just sat at the table and that was one of the times where that stress, that stress that keeps you awake at night, that runs the shower so the kids don't hear you crying, that, that stress, that belief, that, that mark that says you have failed, that was not present that night. So they're the things that I take away and why I think it was such a successful campaign. So we had truth... We had respect and we had determination in spades. Wonderful. Thanks, Marie. Actually, you, hold, you hold on to that. You're this fine. is mine for Anne. That's yours for the night. Oh. Um, so, Anne, talk to us a little bit about what drove you to get involved and what role you played. Um, I guess the role was um, somewhat unexpected, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was... Um, appointed a, a fellow, an inaugural fellow, in fact, by the Paul Ramsey Foundation a year or so ago and given some money to do some research and I was attached to UTS while I did that research. And um, I decided that I wanted to look at, uh, within the, the DV area, I decided I wanted to look at, the, at single mothers because I'd seen a figure in the um, um, personal safety survey that suggested that single mothers experience violence at a higher rate than other women. And so I thought, well, where are all the papers and books and discussions about this? I haven't read anything. So it looked like a promising area of research and one that, because of my deep um, sense of justice and fairness, is one that attracted me. Um, I'm not a single mother myself, but I, I, I feel very strongly about the way in which single mothers in this country have been treated, particularly mm. in the last 20 years, and the way they've been demonised and um, uh, treated so, so appallingly. 
not just financially, but just culturally. You know, this. Mm. I began this research and it turned out that um, the, the information I wanted didn't exist in the public domain. So I had to go to the ABS and they, they said, oh, we've got it, you know, it's all down there in the microdata, but you know, we will, we'll do a customised study. The, the customised study produced this just absolutely unspeakably sensational data, yeah. uh, which showed um, extraordinary high rate of of sixty percent of single mothers had experienced domestic violence. Moreover, that the majority of single mothers were single mothers because they had left violent relationships. So that was the first finding. That was sensational enough. For the other thing that it showed that I hadn't actually gone looking for, but once the data was there, couldn't ignore, was that fifty percent of those single mothers who had and and, and that included those who'd experienced violence were subsisting on government benefits. Mm. And now I looked at the level of government benefits and how the welfare system has changed over the years and how the single mothers are actually living in poverty. Mm. Yeah, past that. <laughs> Is that better? No? Yes? yes. yes. <laughs> it, so the conclusion was it's inescapable that the, there were 275,000 women in Australia then, this is 2016, and I imagine still today, 275,000 women living in violent relationships. Mm. Many of them have tried to leave or have left and gone back. Many others have wanted to leave but do not leave because they have nowhere to go and they have no money. What it boils down to is they know what happens to women who leave because if you don't have a job or if you don't have family resources and you're forced to live on government benefits, you are going to be living in poverty. And so women are forced to make this choice between violence and poverty. And that finding was so stark, and, and no one had presented it that way before, that the conclusion from that was inescapable. And, and so my report became a plea to the government to say, OK, to the government. In fact, I was looking over some of the, my documents that I've prepared during this campaign. And when I went to see the Treasurer last September, I gave him a briefing note, which I'm sure he didn't read, but, <laughs> but it, it contained the, a, a sentence which said, the, the government can't end domestic violence overnight, but it can end single mother poverty. Yeah. And so that changing this terrible change of law that, that Julia Gillard had brought in in 2012 and it came into effect in 2013, 10 years ago, changing that law became if you like, the, the lightning bolt, the, the linchpin. It became the symbol and the reality of what you had to do to not only improve the financial lives of mm. a vast number of single women, but also as a government to signal that you were going to end this regime of treating women with contempt. And I think one of the things that I'm very, very gratified by is that the report, which was published on the 7th of July last year, mm. today is the 28th of July, so it's all happened within yeah. a year. It's been very quick for government. Um, one of the things that has really gratified me is the extent to which that report, which was never public, and we have a little pu published version of it now that we just you know, use internally, but it was only ever online. So you had to go and download it and I was amazed at how much it was down. Five and a half thousand people have downloaded it from Paul Ramsey and another 600 from UTS and, and it's been being published in a few journals. But what amazed me was the number of government ministers who'd read it. Mm. And Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, when I ran into him at an event at the launch of the Women's Budget Statement in, in Canberra in November or whenever it was, October, and he said to me, I've read it cover to cover. And that was very gratifying. I knew then, um, and plus conversations that I was having with Sam, um, I hadn't at that stage met Therese, but I knew about her work, of course. I knew then that we had a campaign in the making and that, 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 that what lay ahead of us was how to make sure... We want first, our first, you know, very impertinent, if you like, demand was change it now, October budget, please, government. And, you know, we've got a big eye roll on that. Um, so we said, OK, we'll settle for May. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. Oh, um, and I'm sure everyone in this room has read the report, but gosh, it's a good read. It re I think one of the reasons why so many politicians did read it was it also read very beautifully. <laughs> so it was an easy read as, as well as an extremely powerful one. And, of course, that data had never really been properly discovered and analysed before. Mm. So... 
I think what's so interesting about this case study is that at the same time that this was going on, there was also this going on, this creation of the Women's Economic Task Force. And I want to talk to you, Sam, about your motivations, but also the role you played. Thank you. And um, I'm just struck listening to Therese and Anne and will be with Laura that just sometimes you get very, very lucky about high quality people who deeply care about an injustice and find a way to use either friendship or respect for one another to actually put egos aside and just do something. And this is a story of um, a group of predominantly women um, who just decided separately and then collectively um, to do something for all the reasons you've heard. Um, I thought I'd just start by saying the, the report that Therese brought us all to Canberra with her uh, wonderful single mothers on that very early morning um, was to put a, a, a report to the parliament uh, on financial abuse and the weaponisation of child support in Australia. And I felt on that day it was such an important morning that I got all the women um, actors in that day mm. to sign it for me mm -hmm. because I like to keep a bit of an artefact of mm. moments and mm. this was one of those moments when um, Therese spoke, the women themselves spoke and then Anne spoke very powerfully and delivered one of the great lines that we might talk about um, <laughs> a little bit that might have got Laura interested um, as well. Um, but there have been moments in this, um, in this time together, separately and together, where we've just... We could feel that the momentum was in place and we had to get as many voices, very diverse voices, mm. telling the same story so that there was an overwhelming mm. sense of... Um, there was no longer a chance to say no mm. to, the, to the push. So I think the, the thing I found fascinating was um, a, a bit like the introduction to tonight as to where the fact that we're in a business school... Um, I was the president of Chief Executive Women, which might once upon a time have been regarded as a, a kind of elite white women's business group, um, that um, in the two years um, during COVID, um, a group of us decided it was time to really lift the sights mm. of this very powerful group of women um, who held incredible positions across not just the business community, but around not-for-profits, universities, um, states. They were a remarkable group of women, about a 1,000. But the organisation had never turned its mind to policy for women generally. Mm. They've been typically doing work on the role of women in leadership, um, the data on the gender pay gap, um, how many women are on boards. It had been very much focused on that sort of that, that more narrow view of progress. And um, with the support of all the members, mm -hmm. we decided to break, breach out into what would be the policies that would be wonderful for women in this country. Mm -hmm. And we were encouraged to do that um, at the time. The New South Wales government had um, a treasurer in Matt Keane mm -hmm. who was very determined to do something. Um, he was doing renewable energy, but as treasurer, he really wanted to do something around the economic participation of women in New South Wales. So I was fortunate, having given a speech at the press club around what Chief Executive Women believed was a course for major reform, including things to do with paid parental leave and lifting the pay rates for childcare workers, those kinds of things. Um, Matt reached out to me and said, would I chair a, an economic advisory committee for women in New South Wales? Which I did and was joined by a, a small group of amazing women um, from across New South Wales. And we delivered a report that led to a $5 billion commitment for the New South Wales government into a childcare fund now held by the education department to guarantee early education care um, and, um, and, and money for childcare workers in New South Wales. So by the time we're heading towards a federal election yeah. and the Prime Minister had put at the front of his campaigning his own story of being a, um, a child, a son of a, a single mother and had told that story many, many times um, and actually told that story again on the, the night that he declared victory. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that speech, he thanked his mother and said um, he, was not, he was going to make sure in his time there'd be no door left unopened for those who suffered any form of disadvantage. And he was specifically, I think, pointing to the communities mm -hmm. that he had grown up around and particularly women. And when I heard it, I just, it just, I thought, there's the moment. Mm -hmm. There's a Prime Minister who's won an election, um, I think because, in part, of mm -hmm. women. Um, the role of the women independents mm -hmm. can't be underestimated. So a number of those women independents had campaigned not just on climate change and integrity, but rights for women and economic justice for women. And so there was this growing sense of a broader coalition coming into the parliament, the highest ever levels of women in the cabinet and numbers of women in the parliament all of a sudden to, to start talking about the issues that affected women's economic participation and fairness and decency. And you'll recall at that time there was a, 
Um, there were the marches for justice. We were also dealing with the horrendous mm. issues of violence against younger women. Uh, women were stepping up, young women. Uh, Brittany Higgins and Grace Tame, um, um, Chanel Contos. Many of those young women mm. were out there showing that campaigning could work. They were getting reform on consent. They were restating, I think, the rights of women and the marches began. And despite there being, I think, a degree of um, um, cynicism about those marches, it was speaking to something that was, I think, grounded in, in Theresa's view of women having had enough, women speaking for other women and actually demanding something of our governments. Mm. Um, that Because with, with a sense that the data, and particularly the data that was to come from Anne, about this profound amount of violence and women, so many women making a choice about staying in violence or entering poverty. Mm. And so, so all these things were coming together in a way that you could feel mm. community expectations, women and, and particularly women, all up and down the economic um, environment, plus a political change. Mm which meant, I think, that we could, we could actually imagine something happening. And then Katie Gallagher appointed Minister for Women and Minister for Finance and Minister for the APS. Mm. So that combination of tasks um, and I think she, her early discussions um, together with her tr the Treasurer and the Prime Minister set a course to mm. say we've actually got a big job to do on women's economic um, uplift, women's safety, and because she was Minister for Finance and a key player in the Expenditure Review Committee of Cabinet, suddenly women's issues in the most important rooms yeah. of the cabinet, not just at the cabinet table, but inside the expenditure review committee. And so it was then that, that Katie appointed the, or said she wanted a, um, a women's economic equality task force, and she asked me if I'd chair it. And she chose the, she together with the cabinet chose the members of that, of that task force, 13 of us. So there'd been five of us in New South Wales, for, for the Commonwealth it's been 13, and Therese was appointed um, <laughs> and had already been seen by the incoming <laughs> government as, as playing an incredible role in that, that, in that group. I'll, 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 we'll talk more about what we then did, but I'll leave you with just uh, a, an insider's reflection on the first meeting of the task force, because the task force has members as broad as the chief executive of um, the ACTU, so the president of the ACTU, mm. Michelle O'Neill, Jennifer Westercott, the chief executive of the Business Council of Australia, Therese, we had um, Danielle Wood, the economist who opened the Jobs and Skills Summit with that cracking speech about um, how important the economic value of women in this country mm. is and set the tone for the Jobs and Skills Summit. Um, and um, Jenny Macklin, a former education minister, a very important minister in previous governments. We, 13 of these, these women together, um, asked to produce reports to the government on how we would increase the economic participation of women, but also look to the intersecting forms of disadvantage, particularly housing, um, violence, um, superannuation balances, the kinds of things you'd expect us to look at. But in the first meeting, when we, we were convened and the minister sat with us, um, she opened it by saying, I've appointed you to be totally independent. I, I don't, I'm not, not going to tell you what to do or how to do it, and I want you to be bold. So when she left the room, um, we had a wonderful conversation and um, Therese spoke first and uh, made the request of the panel and said, could we commit as a group to starting our work by first looking at the urgent priorities for women who suffer the most disadvantage in this country today? Could we agree on that? Because if we could agree on that, that's where we'll start. But you'll get the head of the Business Council of Australia and the chief economist uh, for the Grattan Institute yeah. agreeing to that along with everybody else. Then we start, we start there and we work up there and then we'll get to pay gaps, we'll get to um, paid parental leave, but we'll start with most disadvantage. And that's what we agreed. I think in that moment, Therese, to have every woman around that table just say, that's what we'll do. And that is what we did. And so we preferenced everything to do with most disadvantage. And we started with Anne's report um, and we started to look at single mothers particularly, but also women fleeing violence, um, women in, in late, uh, older women um, with, with homelessness issues, no superannuation balances in poverty. Mm. They were the women we wanted to care about first. Um, and we were able to go to the um, October um, budget with a series of asks of government, particularly around single mothers. We didn't get that on the October budget. We got um, paid parental leave, I think, um, from the minister. But we went again for the May budget, and the minister asked us to give an urgent set of um, budget recommendations. We gave them six, which the primary one was the reinstatement of the sole parent payment. And we wanted it returned to um, age 16. We got to 14, yeah. and we can talk about that a bit later. But, um, but that got up. Um, in the budget. And so our first report, which was really a series of urgent reforms for women we cared about most, 
most of them were met by the government. Um, and I like to think that when you look at the budget statement, I carry the women's budget statement wherever I go um, because <laughs> yeah. it's an article of faith and it's another artefact. Um, it's not just signed by the Minister for Women, it's signed by the Treasurer and the Prime Minister. So the statements in here, I go back and say, are accountable by the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and Katie, the Minister for Women, and they make very big, bold statements about where this government is heading mm. in future budgets and in future policy making. Um, and we started with, with the women that um, I think were honoured finally in the budget, and we will deliver our final report to the Minister um, in the next couple of weeks that looks down the track at the, the next range of reforms we think are necessary for the economic and, um, and social justice reforms for women across the country. But all these things were at play. It was yeah. all, and there's things that happened at these meetings that then became, I think, interesting from a from a journalistic yeah. and media point of view. But we were all operating and making calls. Um, I sent many many copies of um, certain pages of Anne's report to the Prime Minister, um, and and sort of indicated and as he did, he would read it. <laughs> um, there were conversations with the Treasurer, conversations with the Minister for Social Services. We didn't leave any possible option. Um, open. We went down every path um, and we knew that we had um, everyone behind us and a and series of women speaking out in the community at different levels on every aspect of this in their own right, turning up on radio, television. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, the story was emerging that there had to be a response. Um, so that's a perfect point at which to come to Laura because often these things can happen behind the scenes, all these busy people lobbying, etc. But when does it become a story and what made you interested to start reporting on this issue? Um, well, I, if, if I take one step yeah. back, we've, um, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by uh, how you overturn a paradigm in, in, yeah. um, in politics in particular or in uh, economic theory, uh, whatever it is. And if you think about it, the um, basically bashing up single mothers was something that went back, <laughs> you know, and was a very fashionable thing to do. Um, in the sort of Costello era, you know, all those women who were having babies just so they could get welfare, you know, yeah. to, to, to um, and, you know, the same modus operandi was at work uh, more recently with all the victims of robo -debt. Mm -hmm. Um So, uh, for a lot of this period, I was working at the Financial Review um, and, like, mm -hmm. um, so th there was... <laughs> There was basically two models. There was... Um Thank you. <laughs> I love it when I feel like a nightclub singer. Um, <laughs> um, there was basically two models. You were actually either in the media a bleeding heart or you were, you know, you were on board. Right. And um, I think that was certainly the, the sort of division... Um, that I was facing at the at the Financial Review, and you know, of course, the media is now deeply divided between News Corp, which is against anything everybody <laughs> else is against, and and the rest of us um, who. But I think that generationally, this is probably too much information. But mm. generationally, I think a lot of my younger colleagues don't remember an mm. era where you actually had a debate about this stuff. It was mm. just, it was just the way it was. So when this debate came along, sure, there'd been a change of government. Um, sure, there were all these people, ministers, who'd had uh, lived experience of growing up in single-parent households, all those things. But what was, um, I th thought, really potent to me was that, um, you know, if you think about a day-to-day -day way that um, on 7.30 we would cover the issue of single parents, and I know that this actually happened, because I think Therese was probably involved in a couple of these stories, what you do is you go, oh, you know, Single parents, um, bracket single mothers, you know, they're doing it really tough. Mm. You know, introduce case study, you know, uh, his single mum ex, you know, and her two kids, lots of shots of them getting ready for school, you know, making their lunches, all that sort mm. of stuff. Uh, a couple of people saying, oh, yeah, it's not very good. But it was basically reporting something that just was. Mm. It wasn't reporting something that could change. And I think the important bit of... What happened here was, um, you know, we'd, we'd had a position where it had become bipartisan to basically sort of say, well, single mothers, bit useless, really. Um, you know, they're all, all their own hard work. Mm. Um, and it was gutlessness, really, um, on a massive scale um, by an, um, a, a besieged government um, led by Julia Gillard that sort of led to the policy position. So 
you had a few things working for you um, if you wanted to change the policy. One of them was shame <laughs> um, on the part of the Labor Party. Mm-hmm. Massive shame, though they'd never actually admit it. But you also had a few other things. I think you had you had Anne's work, which did link in domestic violence. You had research which said actually this policy is completely counterproductive. Mm. That you're not you're not actually forcing women to go back into the workforce and making making something of themselves. Um, it actually was doing the exact opposite. Um, so on whatever level you looked at, you were saying the policy is shit. Uh, it's not helping people. It's mean. Um, it's contributing uh, to this problem of domestic violence. And instead of a story where you just had one case study of a woman making lunch for her kids and saying, I'm doing it really tough, you had all these different voices arguing all these different cases. And that made it an incredibly potent argument, um, which was very hard for the government to ignore. Yes, I think that's right. I think the key about this was and Sam alluded it to, the massive nature of the alliance, right? That the, the women from, you know, um, senior executive, you know, chief executive women um, also joining the thing, Business Council of Australia, et cetera, et cetera. There was just something I was going to add to Laura's um, depiction of that, because there was also a story emerging, and Therese knew it already, as did Anne, but the women we were meeting who had become single parents because of their escaping violence were certainly not characterised by coming from a low socioeconomic background or the kind of woman that had been the classic misuser of a welfare payment. Mm. These were women who told their stories that they were, they had you know, good, decent lives until they did not. Yep. And they were leaving security with children um, and having nowhere to go and, and they were going to be using this for the first time, this payment, and they were going to poverty, which would affect not just them and their ability to continue to work, which they wanted to do. So they want, Many talked about wanting to be taxpayers, be active contributors to the country, but their children were being affected um, and their educational outcomes compromised. So everything about that policy set, spoke to a woman that no longer existed, mm. if she ever did. Mm. Um, but these tropes and these ideologies, and suddenly we, had, we were able to tell stories about not just the rights of these women um, and their children, but the fact they wanted to be part of an economic story. And as you're dealing with an economy that's coming out of COVID, needing everyone participating, yeah. there was another angle to this. And I think Danielle Wood's work on the economy of women was, was, was yeah. sitting there as well. But it was... that's And, and Therese reminded us all the time about the women that we were really talking about. And, and that report just the 60% of women, mm. single parents, who had escaped a violent relationship irrespective of their background was just and, and devastating. Uh, yeah, and, um, I mean, Tony Wren, who's here tonight, who, who appeared before, I think it was a Senate Committee on Poverty, and she had a line which, once again, was very relatable, which was being on single parents' payment is a bit like being in perpetual lockdown. And um, so it, it, it's what... Yeah. what it, and Which is just an example of those sorts of uh, sort of compelling stories which made people go, oh, shit, I can understand what that's like. Um, <laughs> so it, it, you could identify with people as opposed to them being this maligned group who were b- way beyond your experience. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going, to, I'm going to come and ask a general, more general question about the particular campaign and some of the key milestones because I'm sure there's really interesting things we can pick out of that, <laughs> maybe some good um, behind-the-scenes stories. But I just want to come quickly back to you again, Anne, because I think one of... The um, advantages also of this particular moment was, yes, big momentum, yes, a large alliance of people, but also there was a very specific nature of the ask itself, right? The ask was a doable ask. And a lot of that came from your report because I remember when I first read it, I thought, this woman knows how to lobby government. She's obviously had some experience in government because actually the, the recommendations were precise. Very specific. Clear. And so the question I wanted to ask you is, did you envisage your research leading to... When you wrote it, where you had the advocate um, hat on, did you envisage your research leading to an advocacy campaign? Well, kind of given my life, I guess... <laughs> Uh, a bit hard to separate these things out. I mean, if you if you see something's wrong, or if I see something's wrong, and uh, I generally want to do something about it. I mean, this is an example of of, of things coming together in a in a very um, almost dramatic way, and uh, you know, coming up with these findings, coming up with this conclusion, 
which were devastating. I mean, they really were devastating. We're kind of used to them now. But when we first saw those figures, I mean, I, I didn't believe them. I really didn't believe them. thought it was just... I didn't understand statistics. I'd read it wrong. But um, so, so the way in which I ended the report was to say that, you know, maybe we didn't set out as a country to force women to choose between violence and poverty, but that's what we've ended up doing. So what are we going to do about it? You know, as I, as I said in my memo to, to Jim Chalmers, we can't abolish domestic violence overnight, much as we would like to, but we can do other things. We can relieve the poverty. So the very first recommendation was to reverse the, the Gillard decision and to restore the parenting payment to, to single mothers until their children reach 16. And then there were various others, like I recommend the abolition of parents next, that also mm -hmm. happened. The other recommendations didn't happen. One was to abolish mutual obligations and some of these, uh, the, the ways in which the, the pensions are uh, indexed is different for job seekers and for single parents and for pensioners. So everybody's, you know, moving forward at a different rate. Some, you know, the, the inequalities are entrenched and, and cemented in. So... I guess it was inevitable. I, I can't actually remember the moment, but it, it was inevitable. My report came out on the 7th of July and I had my first meeting with a cabinet minister who was Katie Gallagher on the 18th of July. So um, I guess we got cracking. Yeah. <laughs> and what, how do you get the attention of politicians? I'm sure there's people in the room who want to know, like, how on earth did you have that momentum with politicians and what um, grabs their attention and how do you get in... Well, I just wrote to her. I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't actually really... I think I'd met her once. I didn't really know her. I, I just sent... I wrote a letter and asked to see her. And um, having the report out there helped because they knew who I... And when I went to see her, she, in fact, had a... As I said, the report was only downloadable back then. She had a printed-out copy, her staff had printed out for her, which was annotated and tagged, and she had clearly read it very, very thoroughly... And, um, you know, I said to her, what, you know, what we really need you to do is to um, uh, reverse the Gillard decision and, and restore the, the, the payment to single mothers. And she said, she was very non-committal, mm. she said, well, you really should talk to the Treasurer about that. And I didn't know the Treasurer, I had no real con connections, but I wrote to him mm. too. And to my amazement, about three weeks later, I got a reply. I was like, OK, come and see me. Yep. Um, and... Uh, Getting access to these ministers is not that hard. I mean, Troyes gets has terrific access. Mm -hmm. you? I do a lot of stalking. So you do. <laughs> <laughs> the great story Dad. about Therese is during the job summit, she was upset because she was stuck in a... I, I wasn't there, but she told me this story. She was stuck in a, you know, a Siberia of the, of the conference room, in a, you know, right at the side where she couldn't see properly. But it had one advantage. It was the, the halfway through, everybody had to leave. And when that Prime Minister went to leave, <laughs> she grabbed him. And she, she sat him down and went through my report with him, <laughs> which was fantastic. So perhaps the lesson is about seizing the moments. So let's talk a little bit more about the campaign, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor, because I'm sure there's going to be questions. So Therese, coming We've got to, get a, a quote in. to you... What are some of... So, looking back on the campaign leading up to the budget, what were some of the key milestones, good or bad, and how did you navigate those? Or is there a particular milestone you want to tell the story about? Uh, um, the e excitement for me was to get it in the Women's Economic Equality Task Force and I had to... Oh, Sam was just incredible because... I'm sure you've all been in this position where you have to navigate that sense of being assertive without losing the respect or come across as too desperate or too demanding and you're bringing people <laughs> along. I've, I felt I was all of them constantly <laughs> and jumping in and out. So we got it in and I didn't... I then worked hard to get up to be the number one. And I thought, I'm either going to have lots of love in this room or people are just going to push the eject button. So um, so getting it up to, to number one, I think, was really important because it meant that there was this group that was established by the government is going, yes, 
at last and we think this is the most important one and then it was almost like Anne coming along on the magic carpet with her report <laughs> and picking us all up and taking us further further along. So that was really important and of course I've already spoken about women being there and, and speaking but what was not so visible is how many women who, because um, often, and I, I don't include you in this at all, Laura, but how, how often women have to almost bleed on the altar to get their voice heard in the media and, um, and yet they did it and they did it and they did it and they did it again. So strength and respect begets strength and respect. So more women were speaking out, more women were willing to speak out. So that was an absolute incredible moment. But if am I allowed to talk about after we got the Sure. Seat? So what um, I kept getting phone calls from women all the time saying is it's, it's really going to happen, isn't it? Oh, come on, oh, I think I think we're there. Mm. I think we're there now. The min the prime minister has announced it. I think we're safe because <laughs> um, he announced it on a Monday. And of course, there was the um, federal budget was on the Tuesday night. But on Wednesday, I was, of course, in, in Parliament House. But what I did is I, I have a, a, a pass. So I walked the halls of, of Parliament. I walked the ministerial halls by myself. And I went into everyone, every office, and thanked anyone who was speaking. And I got to the point where I was thanking innate objects. <laughs> I was like, thank you. But I, and what did happen is I did capture Jim Chalmers before he went to the to the press um, conference, the national press conference, and I also um, had a meeting with the prime minister, and I I played him a message from a woman who. Um, had sent me a voice message and it was so beautiful and it was before it was announced and her little boy was there, you know, going, Mom, Mom, and she's going, I'm just speaking to Therese. Therese is going to help us. And this little boy's going, oh, thank you, Louise, thank you. <laughs> and I played that message to the yeah. Prime Minister oh, no. and um, I said to him, so when you think about this policy... I want you to think about this family and I want you to wear it deeply, deeply inside you. And then I went back to, um, to that mum and I said, Prime Minister heard your message today mm. and she heard your little boy speak. And then I watched, watched her messages. So that was, that was pretty exciting for me. But I, I do want to say one last thing is most of you would have these moments where you think, you know, where I was when, you know, Princess Diana died or George <laughs> Michael or, you know, <laughs> or that might have just been me. But I have this place in my lounge room where I was sitting where I heard that this change is going to happen. <laughs> And whenever I feel, you know, a bit sad about a call that I've had, I actually just sit there and I look at that place <laughs> and I go, yeah, <laughs> magic shit happened. <laughs> that's, that's just wonderful. <laughs> Any other can, can I, can I, can it, yeah. I just, I just quickly, because um, this, this is all sounding like, you know, it was a piece of cake. Um, <laughs> And I just remember there was a time, I think it was late in March, late in March, when the press had finally gone off the story and you know, they were running articles in the Herald and what have you, and it was reported um, that the government had made a decision mm. and that they were going to uh, stop it at 12. Yeah. And I was just beside myself with rage. I thought, we have, not come, we have not done all of this, we have not come this far to have this kind of compromise, this absolutely... Playing by numbers, why twelve? You know, why? Why? why what's wrong with why twelve? Um, and I know Sam and I had many discussions about this, with, about what to do and how we were going to circumvent this. And uh, we, we, I mean, the other thing we learned is there was tremendous opposition to to us within the bureaucracy. I mean, particularly within the Department of Finance, they were actively working against the policy. There were certain members of the cabinet who I won't name, um, who were actively... <laughs> <laughs> who, 
later who were <laughs> act actively working against it. Yeah. And even though we had the Prime Minister, theoretically, and, and the Minister for Finance, possibly the Treasurer, we weren't sure, uh, it was by no means certain that we were going to be able to to um, to change this. And, 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 and we all... I, mean, I know Therese and, and Sam discussed it. Are we going to cop it? Are we going to cop 12? Have we come this far mm. to accept this shocking compromise? And I thought that even 14 was unacceptable, but we, we, I was persuaded that that was better than nothing. Um, but I just thought we cannot, we cannot accept 12. And so um, I decided to get in touch with the Prime Minister directly. Yeah, good And I, um, I, I wrote him a letter where I set out a whole lot of arguments uh, as to why uh, this was the bad decision and why he shouldn't do it. And I reminded him of what Gough Whitlam had done in 1973... Um, with the supporting mother's pe benefit and later the supporting parents' benefit and how that was a, a payment that did not expect um, women to work. They accepted it, that, that it was a full-time job raising parents, um, that there was a, a legacy there that this government could, could um, pick up and should pick up. And I don't know whether that had any inf influence on him or not, but I felt I had to do something. Yeah. He, did, he did respond yeah. in a... In a um, very encouraging way, so I hope. And certainly when he announced the policy, when he came back from the coronation and got off the plane in Perth and he announced the policy the day before the budget and he acknowledged the work of Sam and myself, which was very, very uh, nice to hear. So I like to think that our intervention did work. Did work and we got it to 14, which I still think is not enough. There are 15,000 single parents and probably thirty to 40,000 children who have been left behind by this decision. And uh, the other thing to say about it, it's a great decision. It does give them more money, but they're still living in poverty. Yeah. So and we'll get to that too. And I love the fact that you quote a Gough, always quote Gough Whitlam to a Labor Prime Minister. <laughs> they're always going to want very <laughs> clever. <laughs> I think very, very quickly, because I know we're running out of time, a, a couple of shout-outs for people who I think um, did an enormous amount of lifting, and Katie Gallagher mm -hmm. is certainly one as, as the minister who appointed us, who spoke to Anne. Mm -hmm. um, I, w I visited her one day, and she had before her a copy of, the, um, of, of Whitlam's speech in relation to the first women's budget back in the 80s. Um, and so there was a... Um, uh, the Hawk, Hawk one, Hawks, sorry, the Hawk, the Hawk one. And so there were, she had gone back into history. She delivered a magnificent speech, if you haven't heard it, um, to honour Susan Ryan at the mm. Susan Ryan Oration on International Women's Day to the ANU, where she likened her own political ambition mm. and these things to what Susan Ryan had done, coming through the ACT as a single mother, as Katie had done as Chief Minister, then being a minister in a cabinet and fighting for these things and citing Susan's view about you cannot give up on any gains, and every gain you get is the potential for a loss, so keep going. So mm. her, her determination, I think, within the Cabinet room, um, particularly with um, some of the colleagues that w were not as supportive of this and would have been happy with either a no reinstatement of the payment mm. or much lower, um, I think she did an amazing job. The Treasurer was also um, raised by a single mother, mm. so um, he had an interest. So there, there were all these issues that sat there with their thoughts mm. um, about what it really was to be raised in those families. The Office for Women, there were a couple of uh, people in there who worked so hard behind the scenes to get the information through the Department of Social Security, through employment, um, all those things that we needed to get access to and understood what was happening in the build of the policies going into the Cabinet process. Um, they're often under under-celebrated, and they'd also been an area where, as you described, um, Laura, that office under a Morrison government had been... Um, undermined, had been treated as, as as irrelevant, and good good people, good women in the office for women, you know, really were had, had had a hard time supporting good policy. And Katie had come along and asked them to support us. So there were things going on behind the scenes. Um, but we did get word that we'd had some success, but it was sitting at 12, 12 years of age. And we did all. There, we, there were many moments in this campaign where there were. We had furious amounts of work going on and discussions about what to do next. Mm. And this was all happening when we were in Canberra with Therese, um, with a number of the independents and had those women speak about their own lives. Mm. And Anne, I'm going to ask Anne to use the line, Anne spoke at this event in the um, in House of Reps committee room and made a comment about the Prime Minister that was so, so compelling, and I'll get into <laughs> that in a minute, that I, um, I rang a friend in the press gallery brother-in-law perhaps, and asked him <laughs> <laughs> if he could get down and, and have it recorded for commercial television because I thought it was, the extra it was an extraordinary moment from a campaigner and a feminist of such standing that might just shift 
the mood. And um, he, Mark Riley at Channel 7 got in touch with Anne and I think... He chased me out to the airport to interview me, yeah. Mm. And you said... So the line was extraordinary about... Because there was this enormous frustration about surely we can understand why we are doing this and what happens to these young children if they are back into poverty in their early years. And you said if the Prime Minister was growing up today under the system we had in the circumstances he had then, he would... He would be in juvie, not being the he'd not be the prime minister. Ah, he'd yeah. be in juvenile detention, not be the prime minister, and and that had such a compelling moment because it took it back to the children mm. that were affected by this. And I think that then ran on Channel Seven News. I think yeah. it was the second story that night. And I think then Laura, you did a piece that um, Seven Thirty ran a piece with Anne and Therese, mm. really get and made it a made it a story. And a number of us were doing radio all over the country, reminding people what was happening to children at the age of twelve. Most them still in primary school, not yet ready to start yeah. high school, that the age of 12 was probably one of the worst compromises yeah. because these mothers would be preparing their children, then becoming um, dealing with poverty, kids going into complex new arrangements, more expensive um, issues going into high school, and that that would be catastrophic. So I think that next push yeah. got us to 14 against great odds. Wasn't enough, but yeah. um, but we've mm. but we achieved but, something. Mm. But I love that story because I also love the idea of knowing when just to keep fighting, keep like because it's always a tactical decision, right? Like when do you accept the compromise? When do you keep pushing? And it sounds mm. like you absolutely made the right call, Laura. I'm just now going to come to you to say. So it's interesting hearing the story of Anne's brilliant line, which is a brilliant line. Are those the sorts of things that help capture media attention? What what um, this is me also trying to think about lessons for activists and mm. advocacy groups. How how should they deal with the media? How do they get the media's attention on these sorts of media issues, or is it something that's a little bit out of their control? And well, you're never going to be able to completely control it. So the first thing would I'd say is work on the presumption you're not going to be able to control it. Um, but yes, you have to have a couple of stunning lines, preferably. Um, <laughs> You, but as I said before, I think it's really important to have, you know, all of those bases covered. You know, the policy base, the politics base, the human face of this base. You know, you, so that it's not just one of those issues. It's not just, oh, Labor's under a bit of pressure. You know, blah blah blah. But you know, but you're saying actually this is, this policy is shit. You know. Yeah. So I think those are the really important aspects of it. Um, and I suppose just. The other thing that's really interesting is, you know, to understand... I mean, this was basically a coalition of women who hadn't really worked together mm. to get an outcome like this before mm. and to actually sort of be become functional mm. so that you can make decisions like, OK, yeah. we're going to keep fighting, we're going to withdraw. These, these are things that are not to be underestimated, but to also understand, you know where your entry points are, you know, like the bureaucracy has its pluses and minuses, um, but if you know where to go in, you know, that's really important, um, you know, to know which um, levels of poli uh, political player you can work on um, and t to, you know, make decisions like do we go in on this sort of emotional level, do we go in on the hard-headed level? And I think in so many areas now it is really important and if you think about it um, you know the sort of great uh, sort of socio-economic debates of the 80s certainly under Hawke and Keating were fought on economic policy grounds you know the, there was modelling done by people um, not to say you know for in this case oh the you know the sentiment has changed on support for single parents but it was to say you know this is not economically efficient and um, I think you know you should never underestimate the power of actually just being able to argue on all of those fronts at once. Mm. Yeah. Now, I know we're going a bit over time, so I, I do apologise for that. Um, but I did want to give the opportunity for the audience to ask qu some questions if they do have questions. Um, we've got a roving mic up the back here. Oh, there it is. Um, first, let me say I totally love and admire and respect all the women on stage, um, you've done a great job. Um, as a male, may I, in a male-dominated society, may I say my frustration is communication. And, uh, for example, last night I helped a friend's daughter at a strata general meeting get on the committee 
And I noticed that she was talking in indirect language, which I think is commonly female language, and asking sort of roundabout questions, and I gave her sort of direct words, and she put it, and she got the results. She wanted to get on the committee, got the result, got the rip, water leak repair uh, organised. So, so, uh, and as an ex-TAFE teacher, I remember an example um, of a female direct, uh, indirect language asking uh, a subordinate, would you like to write a report on this subject? Came back two weeks later, have you got the report ready? He said, no. I didn't feel like doing it. Her question was, would you like to? And he interpreted that as a male. Would you like to? No, I didn't. wouldn't like to. So, so my frustration uh, with, I think, great um, voice-to-text thing on the screen, I've had a lot of trouble hearing the, the voice here, so it's been great that I can see that on the screen uh, because I couldn't hear it. Um, so, so you... you this is my problem between male and female. Uh, I don't understand a lot of the female language as a male, and in a male-dominated society, you're getting great results, but um, is there a better way to communicate in, you know, the, the five o'clock news, four-second soundbite? Well, that's I think my, we can say question. that. I think that's what we, <laughs> we did. Did pretty effectively. And, and I, I thought it might be useful to read, uh, read you something. I, I'd encourage people to have a look at the letter that we wrote mm. to... The minister and the treasurer um, prior to the um, prior to the budget, because we decided to write a letter with direct language with the recommendations, but we set out the context. And I just want to read you what, how we wanted to position this. And we said that um, Australian women believe their economic security will come from not having to rely on anyone else, mm -hmm. feeling seen and trusted within our economic aspirations, being free from violence, and being able to participate in and have access to decent, well-paid, and secure work. What we have heard is that today they feel frustrated, disrespected and unsafe and that they feel economic security is out of their reach. And it was from that we leapt over to make the, the number one recommendation around the sole parent payment with the lead-in that said um, this is the only way the government can show its commitment to a longer-term pathway of economic reform and demonstrate its ongoing commitment that an investment in women's economic equality is one of the smartest investments mm. that can be made and then put number one, the sole parent payment. Yeah. We wanted to make it quite clear this was not about welfare payments. <laughs> to, and so I guess to, to, your, to your, your comment, um, I think many women do speak direct language. We, we do speak very directly. Maybe it's into an audience that um, <laughs> sometimes chooses not to, to hear the directness of what we're asking for. Um, but we are, but I think an increasing number of women, and we were encouraged the whole way talking to women for whom we, we were advocates that, that they were very clear about how much they'd been left out of this economy. So um, hopefully we're, mm. we're on to it. And, and Therese had been <laughs> extraordinary in bringing in the story of the mm. women. And you couldn't find a more direct report than and some <laughs> comedy or violence report. It's extraordinary. I think one of the things... I think one of the things Therese said at the beginning about that meeting of the women in Canberra and that feeling of truth, respect, equity, that spirit of equality, I thought that was powerful because it's also the strength that that gives you, right? The strength that feeling that you're in a room with a whole lot of people who feel exactly the same as you and you're going to do something about it. I'll allow one more question and then I think we're going to have to wrap up. I apologise. It's such a good quality conversation. I never want it to end. Hi, I just want to ask you a very direct question. Um, uh, I work with women with a criminal record trying to get back into employment. And if there ever was um, an issue about equality and equity in employment, it's actually female ex-offenders. Mm. Because the only uh, discrimination in employment that still exists is... Uh, criminal record, on the basis of a criminal record. Now, I was really interested to hear the numbers of women that are affected by this change in legislation. There are not as many women with a criminal record. It is a very gendered issue. And many women, uh, many researchers are now finding that unemployment discrimination is gendered very much because people don't like to think that women have actually been naughty. And so they haven't been very naughty in most cases and most of them are very disadvantaged. So in terms of changing this discrimination, do you think it's based on the numbers that are affected? 
And how far can we go, do you think, in terms of community uh, uh, emotions, I suppose, and support in uh, running that uh, personal card because we have plenty of uh, stories? I'd just, like, mm. I'd just like to know those, those answers, please. I'm happy to have a quick go. Um, Therese and I were um, in a meeting just this week finalising our final report on, um, the, on this material for the Minister. And one of the things that will be very strong in our report, particularly in the narrative, is that there is no doubt that there is a gendered impact on employment services. Um, and you saw it through robo-debt, um, you know, mm. predominantly women affected by robo-debt. Women cannot get in and out of the um, education skills and job markets as easily as men. We've got a highly gendered disadvantage, set of disadvantages for women in employment. And we'll make a strong comment about, in addition to applying gender responsive budgeting and policy making across the Australian Public Service, to look at those big systems, particularly employment, and to unpack those things where it's most gendered. And I suspect those women who carry a criminal record will be in that category. It doesn't matter that they're a small number, if they will be in Indicative of a group of women who are constantly up against and cannot get in mm. to, to to the work to work, and it's often through the employment services system that that is that's that's baked in. And so we'll make statements about that. I think the new work and skills commissioner, when appointed, will be will be advised to have a gender lens on the work and skills program, which would take them to those groups of women who have a particular set of disadvantages, and that would include the, the women you're speaking about. It would also include women who come to Australia as the partners of um, of professional visas who can't work, even though they are skilled. So there's a, there's numbers of small groups yeah. that are kept out of the employment system. That if you read carefully yeah. what Daniel Wood said about the available um, um, people for our ec economy, these groups of women form a, a backbone of, of opportunity. So I think you're right to raise it. The more there's evidence about their availability for work and the problem in the system that can be solved, advocates like us can raise it, but we want a public service that is actually um, paying attention to those issues um, and reforming it so we don't end up with those women excluded or ending up in the, like the robo-debt victims. Yeah. Um, um I think um, it, do it doesn't come down to uh, numbers, um, but it does come down to a portrait. Um, it, it, I mean, you know, how, many, how many women are there who are facing this? What's the situation they face, you know, in a, in, a, in a sort of, you know, they get out of bed in the morning and this is what happens to them. I mean, most people would have no idea um, about the experience of women who are ex-offenders. Um, so it's a matter of, you know, portraying, of, of getting that data in the same way Anne collected the data on the connection between domestic violence and, um, and poverty. It's about getting that data together and painting a picture of women in this case um, and saying, look, they want to be working and this is what happens when they try to work. And these are systemic problems or, you know, prejudice problems, whatever, but that you actually have a coherent picture of why it is the way it is. Mm. And, and as Jess Hill would know, um, Aboriginal women who are incarcerated often are incarcerated because they've defended themselves in a domestic yeah. violence situation yeah. and they're the wrong offender. So there's a, a large piece of work about who is the offender, yeah. but they carry the stigma of, a, of an offence and come out of jail. And so you've got these compounding forms of disadvantage because of a system um, that is, is against them. So, um, and that's also why a voice matters, because the voice would mm. say for those women, those Aboriginal women, um, that gets back up into a policy discussion about why they suffer such chronic disadvantage in those circumstances. So um, but I agree. I think portrait that storytelling um, and putting it into a context that people can have some empathy with is terribly important. All right, so last question for the night. I apologise for this. Honestly, as I said, I think we could go all night, but we did promise to end by seven. Um, I'm just going to go across the panel now and say, what next? There's obviously still more to be done. So what is the next... I, I was about to say cab off the rank. I'm sure there's plenty <laughs> more than just one cab off the rank. But what next and what do we all need to be helping you achieve in the next couple of years? Mm. <laughs> I'd agree with that. Yeah. It's, it's, a fair, um, it's a fair comment. What... Um, Sorry. 
Yes, you're welcome. Mm. What I would particularly like to see happen is that we seize this moment because not only did we change the parenting payment single, we did slay the beast known as Parents Next. Um, and that was such a nasty, mean thing. But what, what I think can happen is for women to be able to capture their own portrait and write their own slate of who they are and what they want and their voices to be heard. So um, one of the things that I, I find frustrating in the particular in the welfare sector is there's still paternalism. So so others still get to talk on your on your behalf. So that's why I'm really excited to be here. But I think that that is the next piece because once you actually flip the, the script, you then can have really good outcomes that, that flow from that. Uh, I think, um, I mean, the single parents policy... Um, reforms are not over. I mean, I've just run into the Treasurer at a conference recently and said, we are going to get the 16, you know. And he, said, and he said, I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be counting on, on just fin tying up that little particular bow in next, uh, next budget. Um, but, but I think in the, to look at the bigger picture, I mean, the comments made by the RoboDebt Royal Commissioner about the attitudes to welfare and which you've written about beautifully, Laura, uh, in this country over the last 20 to 30 years is something that has fundamentally changed us as a people. We have become mean and un uncaring and un 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 understanding of the circumstances in which people can find themselves and where once we would lend a helping hand, now we, uh, we, t we, tent tent we treat them with resentment, we treat them like criminals, uh, the robo-debt being the most uh, egregious example of that. But even, I mean, the mutual obligations... Uh, which all single mothers still have to do, um, have to perform, uh, that is still, ba that policy is based on the assumption that you are the undeserving poor and you have to do something in order to earn and deserve the money, the, go the paltry amount of money the, the government is giving you. So we need to completely rethink the welfare system in this country. And that includes job seeker, includes everything. Uh, but uh, I think we're, we're, we should have a, another Henderson Royal Commission or something that looks at the whole system because it is really crook from bottom to top. Mm. Mm. Um, I agree with Anna and Therese. We have more work to do on the, the primary recommendations that we put before the government before the last budget. We will lo launch our formal report of the task force, which wraps up at the end of this month in the next couple of weeks and we make a series of, of very significant recommendations to the government of the kind that I was hinting at about where government must continue to go and it picks up things like rental assistance and job seeker and mm. um, supporting wage cases for um, early educators, teachers, nurses, um, all of the care economy. We know that so much of the disadvantage for women um, that is suffered at the end of their lives over the life course with no superannuation and homelessness starts with an insecure, underpaid, inflexible job, often several of them, that holds up the whole show through our care system. So that we're going to talk very much about care and work and where women feature in that. Um, I think, um, and I'd ask you, if you if, when, when we do launch that, um, read the report and whatever support you can give for the various recommendations, your voices matter because if you agree and don't just see this as being matters for government but can see how important it is for the future of the country, we're launching it to, we're, we're, we're pointing out that this is actually dealing with some of the most um, extreme gender segmentation and segregation the world knows in this country. So we're dealing with gendered norms that continue to persist no matter what we've talked about tonight and, and pointed to it in the welfare system. But we're probably one of the most gendered normed countries in the world. We have a view about who does care, who gets to earn, who gets to be wealthy. Um, they're, they're tropes, they're very, they're very, very damaging um, and they hold us back. And we see that most acutely and most dis disgracefully in the rates of um, murders of women by their former or current intimate partners. And the domestic violence death rates at the moment are once again on the rise, mm. which would say that we still not, do not understand what it means to respect women. Mm. So that respect and the gendered norms about where respect comes from, how we raise 
young men to respect young women. I mean, many, this is a broader conversation, um, and the, the Minister for Women is currently in negotiation around the country talking about the national gender equality strategy. Mm. Now, that language might seem a bit obtuse, but it's really to say, can this country actually deal with the gendered norms? Are we prepared to face into that and make some solid changes about how we respect men and women equally and raise children, young people, with that in mind? And ultimately see a reduction in the violence, the extreme violence and death and, and murders that are perpetuated against women in this country. Um, so that, they're, they're, they're big aims, yeah. but you know, that's where the big play is, I think, for this country to be competitive um, and, and, and to show that we actually do care about women. And, mm. and I think there are a lot of men who want to be part of that. And we, uh, this isn't women's, this isn't a zero-sum game. It's a better country. It's a better society uh, when we do these things. So... Just a small, couple of small things. Yeah, <laughs> <my gosh. laughs> what about you, Laura? Um, well, you know, obviously there are a lot of things to be done in the welfare system, like housing rent assistance or housing in general is a complete crisis. Um, but I, you know, since Anne's agreeing with me, I'm going to agree with her and say, you know, we need to change the politics of, around welfare. Um, and, uh, you know, if you haven't read um, Catherine Holmes' opening statement in the Robo Debt Royal Commission, I'd really urge you to do it. It's you know, quite poetic for a judge. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, the, the welfare system, you know, this has been a, a chink in the armour of it, I suppose. But as Sam says, it's also about the workforce. And if you think about what we're talking about here, it's seeing an opportunity and just going for it. And given that um, the greatest growth in the labour market in the next 20 years is actually in the care economy, this is not only the time to be doing it, but it's a time when you've got to do it because, you know, it is terrible. It is just um, people being paid more or less poverty wages to be, uh, you know, to be caring for, you know, our sick, our disabled, our elderly. Um, and so this is something, particularly if you've got a Labor government in, in power, that, you know, is, that has to be addressed, not just because it's a, a good thing to do, but because economically you need to have people able to live and actually provide services that we need. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you again for all of you coming tonight. I think you'll agree with me. That was just a fantastic conversation, so rich, and I just want to give them another round of applause. <laughs> also in the audience tonight is Jess Hill, journalist and author, who is going to be penning a case study. We're so fascinated by the success of this campaign and the different elements that led to that success, that Jess is going to be talking to people, interviewing people, and writing up a case study, which, we, of course, we will share with everyone who registered tonight. You'll also be sent a link with the recording, and we'll also send you details of when ABC Radio National <laughs> decide to play it. So thank you again for coming, and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>